All right, what's up guys? So today we're gonna to talk about a topic that is actually fairly nuanced, um, but I think it's pretty important uh, for any of you guys who do a bunch of shooting. So today we're gonna to talk about rifle recoil management. All right, so uh, when it comes to managing rifle recoil uh, specifically, uh, we've, we've talked about this quite a bit with pistols. When it comes to the rifle, the, a few things change. Um, I think the principles remain the same, okay? So we're still trying to really maintain a very predictable, uh, consistent return to zero. So zero being where our sights were aimed, the gun recoils and the sights need to come back to that same spot, right? Um, I think that's very important for being able to shoot fast, um, but it's also going to kind of, those principles will play out even past kind of that range of predictive shooting once we get out past, you know, maybe 25, 35 yards with the rifle. So a couple of kind of just caveats right off the bat, right? Rifle recoil, the way people manage it, it's gonna be a little bit subjective uh, depending on who you are and how your gun is set up. So um, depending on uh, various things like how your gun is tuned, how your gun is gassed, how, uh, what kind of buffer system you have in your gun, um, even potentially um, your muzzle device, different kinds of muzzle devices are going to affect recoil quite a bit differently. Um, sometimes even the grain weight of the, of the projectiles you're shooting, all of that stuff is going to come into play. So take this with a grain of salt as Justin's going to be shooting his, uh, his ripcord gun as well. It's got a suppressor. Um, so we'll give you guys some ideas of what recoil can look like with different guns, uh, but the principles are going to remain the same. First, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the first of which is Blue Alpha. We're good friends with the guys over there and we appreciate their support of this channel. We've been using their products for a long time. Their EDC belts were some of the first EDC belts Brendan and I uh, ever got when we started carrying. So go ahead and check them out at bluealphabelts.com. We have an affiliate link down in the description below that you guys can use. Helps us out a lot and helps us continue making content just like this. We also want to thank Big Tax Ordnance for supporting the channel. Uh, they're like a one-stop shop for high-end premium gun accessories. You can find a lot of different stuff on their website. I've been shopping there for a long time. Brennan's been shopping there for a long time and we appreciate their support. You can use code GATEWAY10 for 10% off of your order. We get a commission off of that, help support the channel. Back to the video. Uh, very first thing when we kind of talk about recoil, I think the very first thing we got to talk about is how the rifle is actually mounted to your gun. So we call this rifle mount or um, or stock connection, right? So uh, what we'll do is I'll kind of walk you guys through how I like to do this. I'll have Justin jump on the camera as well and talk through how he does it. He does some things a little bit differently than I do. Um, first thing though for me and, and where rifle recoil uh, control starts is from your stock placement. So my stock for me needs to be uh, completely supported by muscle and bone, right? So as the reciprocating mass is coming back through the bolt, traveling through the buffer tube, I want this area right back here to be supported um, by meat and bone, some sort of structure. So as the recoil comes back, I want it to come back into my body uh, straight back. I don't want it kind of pushing off towards the off side of my shoulder, kind of the outside. And the other thing is I don't want to just bury the toe of the stock uh, kind of on my shoulder and then float the end of the buffer tube kind of over my shoulder. So you guys all know the buffer tube kind of runs straight back. And so the top part of my stock right there, I think that's a really important spot to actually get supported by the shoulder. So I'm just gonna bury that into my shoulder like this. Now, a couple different things I like to do, and Justin does differ on this, I'll let him talk about the way he does it. I like to get this stock in as close to under my right eye as possible. That's just how I like to uh, get the gun in there. I feel that I don't have to move my head very much. I don't have to tilt my head down at all from running it out like this. So my head just kind of sinks straight down behind the optic, right? So just like this. Um, as the recoil travels back, what I really like is that it's coming back into my body center line. My stock is touching my collarbone, right? Um, and I feel like I have a lot of support on the gun, uh, just getting it kind of tucked right in there. Now, um, does this change if I'm wearing something different like a plate carrier or something like that? Yes, it can. Um, for me, when I wear a plate carrier, I do butt my stock out just a smidge, just to clear my shoulder strap. Um, is that the best thing, to not be consistent with your plate carrier or not? That's for you guys to decide. Uh, for me, I wear a plate carrier so rarely that I don't think it matters, and when I do throw it on, I just make a quick adjustment, and it's no big deal. I kind of equate it to the same thing as running something like this duty holster versus my competition belt um, and, and that holster. So I have to make a few little changes, but it's not really a big deal for me. Um, 
to the stock placement, making sure the buffer tube is buried beneath my shoulder. The second thing is I'm going to actually shrug my shoulder up and push it forward, right? So I'm not going to have the gun back like this, right? Which is how you see a lot of new shooters shoot. They're kind of pulling the gun back into them like this. I'm gonna roll that shoulder forward so that my, my hips are square to the target, right? And then I'm also gonna lift that shoulder up to kind of bring the optic up to my eye. Now, why, why would we wanna shrug the shoulder and lift it up to our eye? Well, for me, um, that allows me to keep my head in a really nice neutral shooting position. Is that super important? Not really. Some people would argue that actually having my, my head down farther on the optic is better for recoil control. They might be right, uh, but for me, I really like having my head up, and so I run pretty tall um, optics on all of my guns. This is an EOTech on a Unity mount. Um, puts it, um, this one is actually not quite at 226. I think it's about two inches tall, um, but I do really like being able to just kind of uh, shrug my shoulder up, and then that way I don't have to duck my head as far down, okay? It's just a little bit more comfortable for me. Now, with tall mounts, can I still get a cheek weld? Um, yes, absolutely. A lot of people think that with tall mounts that I'm just kind of doing one of these and hanging out with a chin weld. Uh, for me, I absolutely am dropping the stock low, bringing it up to my eye line, and I have a full cheek weld where the stock of that, um, where the stock is really interacting with that cheekbone. Um, for me, that's very stable, it's very consistent, and uh, I've had a lot of really good luck with that. So tall optics, dropping it into my shoulder, lifting the shoulder, rolling it forward, that tends to work out really, really well for me. Um, let's talk about grip pressures. So grip pressures are going to uh, vary a lot, okay? And this is another place where Justin and I differ a little bit. We differ a little bit on stock placement and what we're kind of doing with our shoulder. We also differ with grip pressures. Um, for us though, our support hand, we do pretty much the same thing, right? So support hand is gonna come out here. It's gonna reach out for the rail. And what I'm gonna really look for is I'm gonna look for um, hand placement on the rail kind of about where my pistol would be, right? So if I were to draw my pistol and bring it out like this, kind of leave my hand there, bring the gun up, right? That's right about where my hand is gonna land. You'll also notice that my hand is canted downwards. So if I were to open my fingers, they're gonna open up at a 45 degree angle down towards the ground. I like kind of having that same wrist lock that I do um, with my pistol, with my left hand. Um, and that just kind of helps me kind of lock into the gun a little bit uh, gripping the rail, right? I, I do grip the rail fairly hard, um, but I don't actually pull back into myself all that hard. So some people I know have said, um, you know, take that left hand and just pull the gun back into you as hard as you physically can. Um, for me, that is, that is not a great way to do it. It causes a lot of pressure and a lot of uh, tension for me. Um, and I just don't find that I need to pull a gun back that hard, especially if it's a well-tuned gun, uh, like all of my guns are. So, uh, gripping the rail firmly, pulling the gun back into myself nice and firmly, and then counteracting that pressure by rolling that shoulder forward, right? So pulling back, rolling forward, shrugging up, and that's pretty much money for me. With my right hand, what am I doing with my right hand? Well, for me, this is very similar to shooting a pistol. So when I shoot a pistol, um, the left hand is squeezing uh, really, really hard. The right hand is just kind of chilling out. It's holding the gun firmly enough for it to not move around in my hand. Uh, but I'm keeping it nice and loose so I can run my trigger finger. That's really important to me. So with a, uh, with a rifle, I'm gonna do the same thing. I find if I pull with my right hand or squeeze with my right hand really hard, I'm gonna induce some trigger freeze, which I always want to avoid. So uh, I like to just pull, put a little bit of backward pressure with these three bottom fingers back into the grip. Um, so I'm just kind of cementing the, uh, the grip back into me, but I'm not really squeezing the grip like this, just kind of pulling, tightening it up, helping out my left hand a little bit, and that tends to work out really, really well for me. Um, let's see, from there, Justin, what are we missing? Four grips or not? Four grips or not, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, <laughs> I've kind of been all over the place with this. Um, when I first started shooting, four grips were like, yes, absolutely a must, right? Because I was grabbing onto these and I was just pulling back into my body super hard. I think if you're going to pull back um, and put a lot of backwards pressure, I think four grips or some sort of hand stop like this is very important. Um, however, both Justin and I shoot a similar, similarly with our support hand. We're not pulling back into our shoulder all that much. And so for me, this is really a, a good index point. Now, on a short gun like this, um, I really like having that, four, that, that hand stop, right? Um, this one's from Emissary. 
I really like having that because I don't want to overextend and touch a hot muzzle or a hot suppressor. So that's really what I look for, especially after a reload. Come up, hit that reload, slide it up. I could feel that under my pinky and I know that my hand can land right there and my index finger can even be extended quite a bit and I'm not in danger of touching my muzzle or touching that hot suppressor. Um, so for me, that's helpful. Um, on my 11.5, I've just got kind of these little, it's this, they're almost little nubbins. They're, they serve as a hand stop, but they're just really, really tiny. It gives me a little bit of leverage to hook my finger onto and just kind of pull back into the gun, but it doesn't get really in the way. Now, um, for all of my little short guns, right, 10.3, 11.5s, um, those guns to me are not going to be guns that I'm going to do a bunch of barricade work or alternate uh, shooting positions work with, right? These are kind of um, short, light, easy to maneuver, uh, fast little guns that are set up with a red dot. On like my 14.5, my ADM that's kind of serving a uh, kind of a, a recce roll, right? Or do all roll. It's got a one to six on it. I can put bipods on it. Um, that one I definitely don't like to have any sort of foregrip or hand stop on because as I mount that gun on barricades over a car hood, a truck bed, a VTAC barricade, a barrel, whatever it is that you're mounting that on, it can be kind of rocky to, uh, to, to, to get that thing to stay stable. So I prefer to just use the bottom of the rail um, and, and use, use, use my environment a little bit um, better that way. So can they be useful? Yes. Do you need them? No. Um, I think the most of the pressure that you can exert from pulling back should be from actually gripping the rail. Um, but this does give me a little bit of an, a mechanical advantage. And uh, I think if you want to use them, that's great. Just make sure they don't get in the way of your support hand. Muzzle devices, right? So we talked about muzzle devices a little bit. Muzzle devices do make a huge difference um, with shooting. So uh, I've got three different guns out here. So I've got one that has a surefire uh, brake. So this is there, I think it's called the SOCOM brake. I've got two guns with this. So I've got this one on my 11.5. Um, this is generally a good suppressor host um, for my RC2 or my SPS 300. This one I'm gonna be shooting without any suppression. So I'll apologize in advance for Justin who's gonna to try to get some up close shots of uh, the gas coming out. <laughs> um, but uh, on my 11.5, I've got the same muzzle brake, but I have a suppressor on it. it. Serves as a great suppressor host. And then on my uh, Hodge 11.5, I've got a three prong flash hider from Surefire. Um, Justin, you've got uh, a Griffin muzzle device, right? And, and then your Griffin um, suppressor, right? So uh, muzzle devices do make a huge difference. These are brakes are absolutely the easiest to shoot. Um, just really, really pleasant. Obviously, if you shoot maybe indoors or, or with people a lot, they might get a little bit mad at you, but, uh, but uh, shooting flat is worth it. You heard it here first. Keep in mind, a good break absolutely does affect the recoil um, and is much easier to shoot than something like a three prong or a four prong flash hider. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do here at the range is we're gonna just shoot some doubles. Now, uh, I will be very frank and honest with the internet. I've probably not shot doubles with a rifle for about nine months, right? Um, is there benefit to shooting doubles? Yes, absolutely. Uh, with a rifle, we're just starting here at about 10 yards. Not a lot of benefit in shooting doubles at 10 yards with a rifle, um, but we are going to be showing uh, some, some, some of the laser on the target. It's super bright out, and uh, I have a civilian class laser. So uh, we want to we let you guys be able, actually be able to see the laser to kind of show you what the dot is doing here in a minute. Um, but then we'll push it back and see how rifle recoil control actually affects hits on target as we move farther back at rifle distances, past 25 yards, 35, 50, things like that, okay? Um, but for now, it's just starting here at, at, at 10 yards. We're going to demo on this target up here. So Justin, if you take a look at the target, we've got two three inch white circles up here. Um, so those, those circles, I'm gonna try to keep my hits in there. So uh, right off the bat, I know that I'm gonna put my dot um, right on the top of that circle, right? Just to, just to account for offset. Um, and I'm gonna hammer doubles. Now, the thing, what, what I'm gonna really focus on when I do doubles is I'm going to be pulling the trigger as fast as I can. What I'm doing is I'm trying to dial in that predictive return. So I'm trying to figure out how consistently does my gun return back to zero. Um, and as soon as I figure that out, which might take a little bit of doing, right? As soon as I figure that out, I can apply that all the way back. So those are the right pressures that I need to have. Um, that's how hard I need to be pulling the gun back into me. That's what I need to be doing with my support hand, all of that good stuff. Uh, 10 yards, we want to see a pretty small little group. And honestly, the splits are probably going to be maybe 15, 16, something in there. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. We'll shoot about five pairs here and uh, see what we got. All right.
Press checks are free. Here we go. Woo! All right, so uh, not really used to shooting this muzzle brake a whole lot. Um, and I definitely started pulling back into the gun a lot more than I needed to. So I have two shots off to the side here, um, but everything else is pretty much touching the white paster uh, or the white circle. Um, already off the bat, um, shooting these muzzle brakes, which I'm not used to doing without a suppressor, these things are so flat. I, I'm really putting a lot more input into the gun than I need to. Um, and uh, a little bit of trigger freeze in there. Those are all 14s and 15s, right? Um, so right about at the spot where I thought I would have. Um, let's shoot that one more time and uh, talk about then how my, what my dot is doing under recoil. Here we go. All right, much better. So I quit muscling the gun uh, nearly as much. 14s, 15, 15, 14, and 15, right? So super easy. I'm not trying to go really fast. I'm just pulling the trigger twice. My dot is simply just moving in a tiny little circle, right? Um, for me, my dot goes off to the left, comes back a little bit, um, just kind of in a tiny little C shape or almost like a, like a circle, right? So take a look at the target, right? Absolutely much better, right? Not muscling the gun at all. Um, I definitely don't have to pull into this gun as much as I do my suppressed guns, and all of my shots are well inside of that three inch pacer. So that's, that's kind of more of what I'm looking for. Um, at 10 yards though, right, um, I want to be able to pull the trigger basically as fast as I can and have a nice tight group. Why is that important when we have the entire A zone? Um, this is a question I get asked a lot um, and that Justin and I have discussed quite a bit when it comes to shooting matches and things like that. Hey man, I've got the whole entire alpha, right? And so anywhere in that alpha is worth five points. Um, why does it matter in training to have a pretty small group, right? Well, when it comes to something specifically like recoil control, I think it's because we need the gun to return to zero very, very consistently. At 10 yards, there's not enough dispersion of that, um, of that bullet, of that bullet group, right? To actually be super noticeable. So if I have a really big dispersion on target, right? As I go back farther and farther, that of course, that group is of course going to spread out and uh, cause us to get um, worse hits. And so what we want to do is pretty much push that predictive speed, those predictive splits uh, back as far as we can until we need to start shooting reactively and start um, actually kind of pushing our dot into position where we want it to be. Um, now, in a match, do I, need to sh do I need to keep groups like this super tight, close together? No, in my opinion, you do not. Um, for a match, alphas are alphas, and I'm gonna accept them wherever they are. In training, they do need to be a little bit tighter. So um, let's go ahead and set up a second camera, give you guys an idea of what the laser is doing on target um, at 10 yards, and then we'll start pushing it back and seeing what we get as we get farther back. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna shoot the exact same thing at 10 yards. This time I'm going to turn on my Viz laser. So I've got a uh, Surefire XVL2 IRC uh, mounted up here. Um, civilian class laser. It honestly has a pretty decent Viz laser, but we're, uh, we're shooting in like full sunlight uh, on a cold February day in Wisconsin. So uh, it's a little bit hard to see on the target, but we've got a second camera set up downrange so you guys can see what this looks like. My dot is going to behave very similarly to how the Viz laser is gonna behave on target, okay? So anybody who shot under night vision or used lasers before, you know that we kind of call shots or look for uh, confirmation levels with our lasers the same as we do with our dots when we're aiming with the laser itself. So it's not exactly the same, but I'll try to give you a good uh, representation of it. Now what I did was I went ahead and I slaved my laser um, to my dot at 10 yards. So you tactical boys, don't freak out, right? I will reconverge my laser at a proper zero distance later. Uh, but what I did was just putting it at 10 yards just so you guys could see exactly what I'm seeing um, on the target. So let's go ahead and shoot this and give you guys an idea of what this might look like. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Lasers on. All right, I accidentally bumped my laser off at one point, but I turned it back on. So 
a couple of shots returning a, a little bit low. Uh, these two returned a little bit high, but honestly, guys, like this is exactly the kind of group that I'm looking for um, at a target like this, right? So um, you guys notice holding my dot kind of right up here, just accounting for offset because I did uh, go ahead and slave it to my optic. Um, and yeah, that's a pretty good group. So that's kind of what I'm looking for with rifle, re rifle recoil management. Now, uh, everybody goes, okay, yeah, but it's 10 yards. Everybody can shoot decent groups fast at 10 yards. And I would agree, you should be able to do that. Um, especially, especially like half A zone, right? Six by six, something like that should be very, very, very easy um, with a rifle. Now, when I push that back though, this little group is going to open up to be about the size of the alpha at 40 yards, right? At 40 yards, this is gonna be about as wide as the alpha zone. And these little flyers are going to probably be Charlie's or potentially even deltas, depending on the dispersion. So um, super important that we're managing recoil the same way, regardless of the distance and regardless of whether I'm shooting predictively or reactively, right? I want my gun to be returning the same way. The only thing that's gonna change as I get past that threshold of my ability to shoot predictive splits, uh, that's going to be um, determined by just my sights, right? So based off of what I see, how much time I need to settle my dot in the acceptable area, that's all that's going to change, all right? So with that being said, let's go ahead and push it back to about 25 yards and shoot doubles and see what our shot group turns out to be. All right, back here at 25, let's try the exact same thing. Here we go. Whoo, getting a little bit of movement. Also that target is moving back and forth a little bit. Uh, 14s, 13s, 13, 13. Uh, yeah, definitely pushing the speed a little bit. So uh, as a rule of thumb, you should never blame uh, your environment, the gun, the target, those things. Uh, however, this one was for sure me. I pushed it low, but also this target <laughs> did one of these. So uh, I think that would have been alpha, but it would have been low. Same thing with these. Um, but for the most part, man, I'm getting kind of like a, what is that? Maybe a four inch, five inch group right there in the middle of the target. So I'm pretty happy for the most part when I was doing my part right. When I started pushing on the gun, those first two shots uh, drove a couple of shots low, right? So I'm getting first shot here, second shot here, first shot here, second shot here. Um, again, the target moving back and forth didn't help at all, but you guys kind of get an idea, right? Anytime I shoot doubles, I'm probably gonna have a couple of little flyers like that. But as long as you know what it's from, um, you are good to go. So you guys could see before I had a group that was about this size right here, right? Now I've got a group that's opened up. It's about maybe double or almost triple the size. Part of that is me. I could probably shoot a little bit better of a group at 25, um, but I was also kind of hammering on the gun a little bit more, 13 splits. Um, you guys can see the dispersion opens up. So for me, 25, what this should tell me is that I should be able, uh, especially with a little bit of work, to pretty much guarantee alphas on an open target at 25 yards, shooting predictively, shooting those sub 15 splits, right? Um, and certainly if I were to bump up the confirmation just a tad, still shooting predictively, but maybe shooting, let's say, you know, 17 or 18 splits, that is really going to probably be money uh, for guaranteeing really, really good alpha zone hits um, with the ability to really call my shots uh, very, very well. So let's go ahead and pace these up. Um, hopefully the laser showed up on the target for you guys. Uh, obviously it's gonna be a little bit offset because I slaved it at 10 back at 25, um, but hopefully you guys got an idea of what my laser is doing. Um, one thing that I wanted to correct really quick, I think before I said my, my dot goes up and to the left, my dot goes up and to the right, okay? So uh, directions are hard for me, um, but you guys, you guys get it. I know a lot of you guys have problems with left and right and things like that and counting and things. Uh, so um, you guys understand, all right? Let's push this back one more distance. Let's push it back to about 40, 50 yards and try this one more time and see how our groups look. All right, so we're back here at the 50 yard line and we're gonna shoot uh, predictive doubles back here as well. Now. Quick caveat, right? At 50 yards, for me, my, my level of ability, right? I know that to be guaranteeing A zone hits, which is pretty much the accuracy standard I hold myself to, um, shooting predictively is not it at 50, okay? So um, if, if people are saying, you know, shoot doubles, push it back and back and back, understand that that is a training aid, right? What I'm looking for right now is to control recoil the exact same way as I was at 10 and see how big of a spread I get on target. 
when I actually go to shoot for real and, 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 and actually make sure I'm getting points, I'm looking to control the gun the exact same way. I want it to behave exactly the same. Nothing changes, but I'm just adding a little bit more confirmation in what I actually see on target, okay? So if, if I shoot, the gun doesn't return perfectly, then I will make an adjustment and then I'll fire, right? Um, if, I, if it comes right back and uh, it, it returns improperly, it returns low, I'm muscling the gun, doing something like that, um, man, I'm gonna make sure I correct that when I'm shooting for real. But for training purposes, let's go ahead and try this. Confirmation one, I'll probably be like 18 splits or something like that right in here, all right? Don't shoot the camera. <clears throat> yeah, don't shoot the camera. I'm gonna try not to shoot the camera. <sighs> Woo, all right, here we go. All right, so I'm definitely seeing my dot jump off to the right uh, quite a bit. Um, a lot more than I'm happy with. Uh, probably three of those pairs were good, and like three of those pairs were pretty awful. So let's go check them out and, uh, and see what we got. Did you shoot the camera though? Um, I think I hit your tripod, yeah. but my camera is fine. Yeah, so. Great. That's, that's fun for you. That's, that's awesome. Gnarly, gnarly, gnarly. Okay, so three of those doubles, right? I was getting kind of pushing off over here, right? This one, um, to be honest, I don't remember when I shot this, um, but that's pretty unacceptable, especially given the way my gun uh, returns, but 50 yards shooting predictively. The splits. 22, 18, 16, 19, right? We're right there, kind of in that in that realm of we're still shooting predictively. I'm not taking time to re-aim the gun, um, but I'm absolutely not, uh, not really waiting on it, right? So um, honestly, 11 alphas and three Charlies uh, for seven pairs is not horrible. Um, you guys can see though, the dispersion is really kind of opening up. Um, a little bit of left to right movement back at 50 yards, a little bit of starting to kind of muscle the gun or trying to correct the gun with my muscles is definitely costing me. So these two over here are Charlie's, they're close. This one over here uh, feels about the same distance away, but it's already a Delta. So uh, shooting points uh, like that, probably not it, but it does tell me that if I'm back there shooting probably like 45, 50 splits at 50 yards with a rifle, at least with this rifle, um, I'm probably going quite a bit too slow because I'm shooting sub 20 here and 90% uh, or so, 85% you know, are alphas. So at 50 yards, I go, let's add back a little bit of confirmation. I'm not going to dictate it off of the splits. I'm gonna dictate it off of what I see, but I know just based off of shooting confirmation levels and how it co correlates to split times, I'm probably gonna be more around like the 30 mark. So 0.3 is probably gonna be pretty good for um, guaranteeing uh, alphas, 90, 95% alphas. So let's go ahead, shoot this one more time at that kind of uh, good match mode pace where we're guaranteeing alphas, but making sure that we control the gun the exact same way as we've been doing shooting all this predictive stuff. At least three of those are great. Three of them not so great. We'll go check it out though. Um, so back here 50 yards, like just being honest with you guys, very, very difficult to stay target focused, really easy to get sucked into the dot. The other thing that I deal with is wanting to direct the dot with my support hand versus just allowing kind of my natural point of aim to steer the dot back to where it needs to be. That causes me to oftentimes pull the gun low or pull the gun to the left because the dot is recoiling to the right. Um, and so I'm oftentimes trying to overcompensate for that. Okay, so yeah, exactly, exactly what we're talking about. So this one, overcompensating for recoil, trying to pull the dot back because I'm seeing my dot go kind of up and up and kind of in this direction, right? So I'm pulling it back and I pull it back too far and run the trigger. 
Uh, down here, this one was very simple. I saw my dot come up and I returned the gun by just kind of bringing more weight down into my elbow. Dropped a little bit low. This high one, I didn't call that high, but again, at 50 yards, the dispersion is bigger than you think. So I thought that one would have been pretty close, maybe right on the top alpha line is a little high. It is what it is. This one is a very, very close Charlie, but everything else is uh, kind of an up and down dispersion um, in the A zone. And uh, one, two, four Charlies, right? One of them being super, super close. So um, for me, like that's pretty, uh, pretty standard for me at 50 yards. Um, can you push it? Yes. Do I need some work at 50? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but I think that's kind of what I would expect to see out of myself, just re relying on, 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 on staying target focused, making sure my dot is returning and correcting it if it goes wrong, right? I could probably even give a little bit more back to the target to really guarantee alphas, but that would be like a good match pace uh, for me. Um, so what does your dot look like in recoil? Yeah, so my dot in recoil is uh, is kind of coming up, right? And it's it's kind of going off to the uh, right hand side, and then coming back down like this, right? So it's kind of up and back down. So it's kind of a like a like an like an oval in like the eight to two kind of kind of realm, right? Now when I'm really close, I hardly notice it at all because it's just kind of uh, streaking in a very small little circle, right? Uh, close. Um, inside of what I'm shooting, but at 50, I notice it because based on the silhouette of the target, I can see my dot interacting with the shoulders, the head, the neck, dropping low to like the belly area, things like that. So, and something to be aware of. One thing though is do pay attention to your dot, but uh, stay target focused. Just be aware of what it's doing, right? Don't really get sucked into that thing because that's not going to give you good results because as soon as you start focusing on the dot, as, as all dot shooters should know, as soon as you start looking at that thing, we lose awareness of where it actually is on target and it, it, it tricks our minds, right? We don't have, um, we can't trust that, uh, that perception. So guys, try this out with rifles. Um, play around with different grip pressures, play around with stock placement, um, all that type of thing. Let us know what you think. I'm gonna jump on the camera, let Justin grab his rifle. He's gonna walk us through some of the differences that he uh, uses, you know, different techniques that he uses to uh, get really good results for him. And they're a little bit different. So hopefully that'll be helpful for you guys. Something we're really passionate about is principle-based training and not so much technique-based training. So Brennan and I do things a little bit differently, but we usually come to the same results uh, and very similar performance. So one of the things we do differently is stock placement. So Brennan keeps his a little bit more in line with his eyes. I keep mine a little bit farther out. So I have kind of the shoulder pocket right here and I have my sternum and I keep my stock right about that halfway point. Um, and I can feel there's a good amount of muscle there, kind of where my pectoral muscle starts, and I can push in enough to where I can start to kind of feel my, my skeletal structure right there. Something I heard Mark Smith of JBS Training Group talk about is uh, pushing past kind of the pillow of muscle and getting to that tree or that, that bone uh, as close as you can to support your gun and manage recoil with a rifle, and that made a lot of sense to me. So I keep the stock right about right there. That's going to be about what it looks like. I run a 193, so similar to what Brendan talked about, I can keep a relatively good head position, um, burying the stock into my uh, into my body. The top of the stock and my buffer tube is about in line with the top of my shoulder. That may vary every now and then, uh, but that's about where I would want it. Now, as far as pressures with my support hand, um, I'm not gripping the rail very hard. I'm not gripping it as hard as I would like on a pistol, um, but I'm still pulling back into my body uh, a good bit. Uh, Brendan and I, are, we do that about the same, uh, and I'm gonna counteract that rearward pressure with just a little bit of uh, forward pressure with my shoulder. I don't shrug my shoulder up uh, quite as much as Brendan does, but I counteract it just enough to where it's kind of not pulling my body back and um, not keeping my shoulders square to the target. So I'm gonna pull the gun back into my shoulder and counteract it just enough to keep my shoulders and my upper torso square towards the target. My strong hand, I'm squeezing the grip a good bit. Um, it's not very strong, but it's about as much as I would on a pistol, which Brendan and I also kind of differ a little bit on. Um, it's not as much to where I induce trigger freeze or anything like that, um, but I'm giving it a really solid handshake. It's kind of the, uh, the analogy I use. Something Brendan didn't cover, uh, that I'll just kind of touch on real quick is just stance. 
Uh, I think stance can be helpful. Uh, it's one of those things where it's not the most important thing, especially if you're gonna shoot a stage and there's a lot of movement, but it can help, especially if we're just shooting static. What I like to do is I like to keep my, uh, sh uh, my hips square towards the target. I do not like to blade off like this. Some people do that, they get away with it. I personally do not like that. I keep my hips square towards the target, my feet shoulder width apart, and I just take one small step back with my strong leg, so my left leg, because I'm lefty. And that allows me to square towards the target and get really good, uh, kind of a really good mountain structure behind the gun as I kind of lean into the gun and apply all of those pressures. So we're at 25 yards here. We're gonna shoot some doubles and uh, put it to work. I am going to turn my mall on, but I don't think, yeah, I don't think we're gonna see that in broad daylight. Okay. Here we go, I'm gonna shoot confirmation one, predictive splits at 25 yards, and we'll see what we get. Here we go. Okay. All right, so splits on that were 18, 17, 19, 19, 18, 17. So I'm a little low. Um, I'm getting a little bit more left to right movement than I would like. Um, I'm not totally sure where that guy came from. Uh, was that there before? Might have, I don't think so. I think the pacer fell off. Okay. Um, so I'm getting a little bit more left to right movement than I'd like. I'd like it to see a little bit more uh, um, up and down, but my dot, I can see my dot. What my dot is doing, at least at 25 yards, it's gonna be a little bit more exaggerated farther out you go, but at 25 yards, my dot is kind of going up and it's kind of doing this oval shape similar to what Brendan uh, had talked about before. So com uh, confirmation one, predictive splits, right? These are, these are still in, so one Charlie, right? Um, I'm not super happy with the group. I would like it to be a little bit more concentric, but um, not bad. So now let's go back to 50. We'll do predictive splits at 50 and then uh, shoot some match mode and see what we can get. Okay, let's go check that. There were three of those I did not feel good about. I think there's two a little bit low and right. I can feel I'm kind of pushing into the gun a little more than I need to. I don't really want to push into the gun to counteract recoil. I just want to mount the gun and provide enough structure behind it so that the gun just returns by itself. That's the goal. Okay. So those are the two I was talking about. That one, I call that one's not quite as bad. Um, Delta, we got a couple of Charlies around here. Um, not great, but like Brennan had talked about, that's not really the goal for me. This isn't what I would actually do in a match. So let's go shoot doubles again, shooting confirmation two, and the way I would actually shoot it like in match mode. All right, let's check that. So the splits are a little slower on that. 57, 55, 48, 45. You can kind of see, I'm still a little low. Uh, I got a couple, uh, two high here, one to the right. That one was my second one. I felt I could, I could I'm always tempted to push into the gun a little bit because my dot's going up into the left, so it's, my temptation is always to kind of push into it, which is what drives my shots a little bit farther right. Um, but for the most part, I can be a lot more confident about landing alpha hits uh, at that speed. All right, so in order to tie all of this talk about rifle recoil management together, we're going to tie it into a drill called the Billy Drill Standards uh, drill come up with by uh, Billy Barton of Spectrain. So um, this is initially um, a pistol uh, drill shot at 7, 15, and 25. The idea is applying the correct confirmation level. Um, 7, 15, and 25 generally works out 
pretty good to be confirmation one, two, and three for most shooters. We're going to adapt this. I'm not sure if Billy has actually put out the rifle distances officially yet, but we're going to do 10, 25, and 50. So 10 and 25, um, still going to be confirmation one. The recoil management is going to be the same all the way back. 10 to 25, probably shooting pretty similar splits, so the time should be pretty much uh, pretty close. And then once we get to 50, probably have to dial it back, confirmation two, um, but we'll see how this shakes out. So I'm gonna give this one run, Justin will give it one run, and, uh, and then we'll have concluding thoughts. Here we go, 10 yards. Six rounds. <clears throat> Stand by. I was a 158. 158, pace back another 15. One, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right in here. Ooh, that feels, that feels far. All right, here we go. 15 yards, stand by. Two one five, two one five. All right, back here at 50. Stand by. <laughs> uh, 357. <laughs> that felt not good at all. All right, let's go ahead and calculate up our times. So 357. Plus a two, one five, plus a one, five eight, equals a seven three. I definitely have some Charlies. Ooh, looks like I have a Delta or two, potentially. Oh no, those are Sharpie marks. Okay, thank goodness. I thought these were all Deltas, but no. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five Charlies. Let's make sure I have 18. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So all 18 are on the board and five Charlies, so that adds, uh, Charlies are half seconds, Deltas are plus one second. So five Charlies would be uh, two, uh, two and a half seconds, right? So seven three plus 2.5 is a nine eight. All right, so nine eight hit factor on that, or uh, I guess it's more like time plus. Um, yeah, not bad. Um, Again, not really sure if these uh, if these distances quite equate to the pistol ones, but I know for the pistol ones, the goal is kind of to get it under 10 um, for his patch. Um, so Billy, when you watch this, I'm sure you'll DM me and let me know uh, that the distance is wrong. But for the distances we chose, I passed. So I expect a patch in the mail. <laughs> Not very good. It's not as much for I use trigger freeze or anything like that. That was a 196. That's gonna hurt. Here we go, 25. It was a 268. We go 50 yards. Okay, that was a 485. All right, so we have two Charlies and a Delta, which is not good at all. Uh, each Charlie is half a second, so two Charlies is one second, and then one Delta is another second, so two seconds plus 9.49 is 11.49 uh, seconds. Not very good. I guess I need a muzzle break. All right, guys, so there you have it. That's our take on how to manage recoil on the rifle platform. Um, keep in mind, guys, it's, it's always going to be about principles over techniques, right? And so what we mean by that is if you're, if you're doing something and it's not working out for you, it's not giving you the results that you need, 
change the technique so that you achieve the result that you're after, right? So for me, one of the biggest things that I've been changing recently is instead of having the elbow kind of torqued upwards, I'm kind of dropping it and trying to trying to pull straight back into me instead of kind of torquing into the gun. I found that was driving the gun to my to my strong side too much. Little things like that can change quite a bit about how the rifle behaves. So look for that good predictable return to zero. Uh, make sure you guys are getting out and shooting your guns, um, especially if you have different setups and uh, experimenting. That's about it. If you guys want to kind of get into uh, recoil management and confirmation levels and things like that on a much deeper level, be sure to uh, look out for a rifle class coming near you. If there isn't one in your area, be sure to reach out to us. We'd love to uh, come to you guys. All we need is a host. We've got a whole hosting section um, on our website. And so uh, you guys can read up what it takes to uh, bring us to your area. We'd love to come out, put on a uh, rifle class for you guys. Hope this was helpful for you. Until next time, keep practicing and shooting, and we'll see you on the range. Good? Yep, we're good. Okay. Lower. Lower. I can't. I can't. Couple index.